Hello, everybody. I'm glad you're all talking with each other. That's uh, one of the points of the symposium. But let's get back um, to talking about uh, public health communication. Are we on? Okay, so we had some, uh, those are great, um, yeah, thought-provoking talks from uh, Dr. Tan and um, Jiro. Um, okay, our next, our third speaker um, is uh, well known to all of us, Dr. Harold Pollack. He's the Helen Ross Professor at the Crown Family School of Social Work Pol and Policy at the University of Chicago. He's an affiliate professor in the Biological Sciences Collegiate Division and the Department of Public Health Sciences. He's faculty co-director of University of Chicago Urban Health Lab, which he co-founded, and he received a 2014 MacArthur Award for Creative and Effective Institutions. He's um, really our social media guru on campus. Uh, he's uh, also published widely at interfaces between uh, poverty policy and public health. He uh, publishes in a wide range of journals, including Health Services Research, American Journal of Public Health, JAMA. Um, he writes regularly um, for the Washington Post, New York Times, Vox, Atlantic Monthly, and other publications. And he regularly advises local, state, and federal policymakers on public health and crime policy. So Harold, welcome. Thank you, Albert. It's uh, it's always a privilege to be welcomed by my good friend. There, I must say, as Albert pointed out, I, I write regularly for the Washington Post and other outlets. Whenever I write something, usually within like 45 minutes of it showing up on the internet, I get all, I get all kinds of high five emails from my colleagues, and because you know people follow me on Twitter, or whatever. I didn't get too many high five emails for the uh, talk I'm about to give today, uh, and. And I'm reporting from the front about a raging debate that is actually happening inside my own head. Uh, and probably the heads of many of us, which is how do we handle the times that we are in that are just profoundly polarized and, and how to deal with the reality that we have unworthy strains of American politics that are very present in public health as we're trying to, I mean, you know, present in, that we are up against in public health. And how do we respond to those realities while we are being culturally competent, respectful with all communities? And, and I would say that as a community, we have done an okay but not great job in that. And that's really what I want to talk about today over the next three hours. So, um, um, so first of all, I think there, there, there's, a, there's a couple of realities we have to acknowledge that push both sides of the debate that are in my head. One is that conservative voters and conservative political elites really have identified the public health community with Democrats, with political liberalism, and have chosen to become political adversaries of many public health efforts. And that's not the first time this has happened. Those of us that are old enough to remember the HIV crack epidemic days, needle exchange, we've seen this play before. Uh, but it's, it's, it's profoundly unsettling and, and in some ways it knocks us off our own game as we're trying to focus on public health problems. Uh, and, and one of the things that as we struggle with that, it really brings out the necessity, but also the limitations and pitfalls of our own values, commitments and norms as a public health and social service community. There, um, and, and the need to combine some very, uh, not, not uh, inconsistent things, not contradictory things, but divergent things as we approach our work. And you know, one is the need for core commitments to anti-racism, LGBTQ plus equality in a political time where these have come under question. And uh, it is uh, the idea that one could become elected president of the United States while expressing frankly racist views on social media is not something I would have predicted in 2014. And that's something that happened. And, and I just wanna name that straight up uh, because I think a lot of us feel tremendous anger and concern about the country that is coming from the unworthiness of 
President Trump and some of the other folks that are, that are important political actors, you know, Fox News and so on. There, and I just uh, wanna say that, uh, wanna say that straight up, but that as we think about that unworthiness and as we're angry about it, we have to be self-aware that it's pushing us into some unforced errors as we try to reach out to all communities when we have a public health crisis like COVID, okay? Um, and and I, I just wanna talk about some of that. And I think one of the interesting things is, one of the things we've seen with COVID is the emergence of politically, religiously, cultural communities as genuine disparity populations in an important way that, that also needs to be named. And you know, I'll show you some statistics about COVID. You won't be surprised if you're following the epidemiology of COVID, but it's a real thing. Right? So now I should say, I'm not the sort of person you would expect to make a lot of the arguments I'm gonna make over the next three hours. There, um, by the way, uh, I, I realized I forgot to set my timer. I noticed, uh, if, I, I saw some terrified people who must have may come to the same realization. The, um, uh, how far into my talk am I? Five minutes? Ah, good. So, um, you know, these are just some of the things that I do on social media. Uh, you know, Paul Ryan failed because his bill was a dumpster fire. You can see I have that subtle touch in the, I don't pick the headline. The um, uh, political ads that I made uh, uh, criticizing President Trump, also criticizing President Reagan and noting that President Reagan's opposition to civil rights laws and his response to AIDS. You know, a lot of people say Trump was a real outlier. Well, he, if you actually go back to the 1980s and the early 1990s, many of the things that President Trump says now are things that were commonplace back then. So, so you know, I am, I, at Crown, I'm the House conservative, but I'm in the rest of America, I'm known as a liberal Democrat. Uh, there, um, so, so I think maybe that puts me actually in a good position to make some of the arguments that I think need to be said that we have shown a poor lack of cultural competence and humility in dealing with a lot of communities. Uh, when we think about our reaction, so, you know, my body, my choice, Trump 2020. A lot of us are like, in the wake of the Dobbs decision, that seems very ironic. Uh, but you know what? That's the way a lot of people feel. And uh, when we are so distant politically and culturally from a lot of these folks that we, that we might be tempted to, uh, uh, to not work with communities in a culturally competent way. Uh, and you'll see, I, I have a couple proposals that I get to at the end, which are in the non-high five category uh, you know, in, among my colleagues. So one reason, of course, why we react so the way that we do to these pictures is because of these pictures. And I do think it is, we are in a really difficult time. And, you know, uh, so, you know, harassment of public health officials, I, I've just never seen anything like that. The idea that, that people would, not only that people would threaten public officials, but that actually, if you look at survey data, say from the Amerispeak survey, there's surprising amounts of public support for harassing public health officials. And we see that, and we also see, of course, people are leaving the public health workforce uh, because of that. And you know, there's no question, a lot of public health leaders at the state and local level have said, I just can't do this. People are calling my house and threatening me, doxing me on social media, things like that. Uh, and, uh, and of course, the attacks uh, you know, on Anthony Fauci and others sort of speak for themselves. And uh, you know, we're in an angry time. I'm angry, a lot of us are angry. By the way, this is, I should say that another thing is when I mentioned the unworthiness of President Trump, Dr. Birx was President Trump's own COVID advisor. And she said, basically his behavior caused hundreds of thousands of COVID deaths that didn't have to happen. In large part, because of the way that his behavior interacted with that polarization. Imagine uh, you know, if we had a replacement level president during COVID, we would have, like George W. Bush in terms of public health, we might've had a different outcome. So the stakes are pretty high. Let me just show you some of the disparities by political affiliation. This is at the top left, we have monthly trends in COVID vaccinations. Very large differences by partisan affiliation. Average daily COVID deaths in the United States. This, I wish I had a more current one than this. I'll show you in a minute, I've got a more current graph. But counties with large Trump voter shares had markedly higher 
COVID deaths. And Charles Gaba has been putting up these plots where he just shows COVID deaths, COVID death rates by percentile, by decile voting. And you just see the red, the deep red places, much higher COVID rates. Okay? So th there's a recent NBR working paper by Jacob Wallace, Paul Goldsmith Pinkham, and Jason Schwartz out of Yale, where they look at the excess death rates for Republicans and Democrats during COVID-19. And what they found, not surprisingly, what you have on the x-axis is share of county populations that got at least one dose of vaccine. So in the, in the, what they, in the post vaccine era, what the, not surprisingly, there is um, in the pre-vaccine era, we see there's really a big differences in COVID vaccines, but they're not partisan divided. You know, if you're living in a county where people aren't really bought into COVID protective behaviors, high COVID death rate. Look at after the vaccines emerged, we see that red line of registered Republican voters, markedly higher mortality rates. So, you know, overall they found the excess death rate for Republicans, 76% higher than the excess death rate for Democrats. And post back, and it was all basically post vaccine. And what they found is that post vaccine, 100, that, that the excess death rate among Republicans rose to 153% of the Democratic excess death rate. That is incredibly, if you look at the risk of low birth weight and you compare smokers to non-smokers during pregnancy, the excess, the excess incidence of low birth weight is about 100%. And we'd say smoking is a really serious driver of low birth weight in the United States, 153%. And it really concentrated in counties with low vaccination rates in the post-vaccination period. So the lethality is really the, the, the disparity in vaccine take up. Okay. And, and we need to reach out more effectively to folks that look at stuff like this and find this, something to identify with. That, and that's not easy to do. Okay. We have some good models. Identity vouching, public health messaging. So I was trying to find a fuck you liberals mask. I couldn't find it, but that would be ideal. You imagine if we were fighting about what was written on the mask instead of whether you're wearing a mask. You know, like I could promise as a liberal Democrat, I could go on Twitter and I could say, I am so offended by your fuck you liberal mask. I am just snowflaking out. I don't know what to do. Like that would be the most culturally competent public health messaging I could do. They're, uh, you know, I'm this nerdy University of Chicago Jewish liberal professor, and I hate your mask. The, um, but we have, we, we have, uh, but, you know, make America great again masks. Uh, you know, think if, if, suppose President Trump decided to make money by just putting out MAGA masks and charging 25 bucks for them, we'd have, COVID mortality would have been a lot lower. Somebody should have approached Jared Kushner with that idea. Uh, the, uh, maybe the Saudi Arabia could do that next time. The, um, um, but you, know, you see that, you see Mitt Romney is putting on a mask. You know, that's identity vouching. And, uh, and that's actually quite important. Let me show you this dude on the left here. So this is actually, we have good models for public health campaigns that involve conservative, culturally, religious, political communities. So it, the people that operate gun ranges and who are active sportsmen with guns, one of their great fears is that someone's going to show up at a shooting range, check out a gun, and die by suicide. If you, if you operate a gun range, that is a primeval fear, that you've got some depressed, middle-aged dude shows up at your shooting range and dies by suicide. So they actually have an effective public health campaign around suicide prevention that the NRA is involved in, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention is involved in, and the National Shooting Sports Association is involved in. And you can see we've got this Sam Elliott dude look alike here, saying, have a brave conversation. We all have mental health just as we all have physical health. Sometimes life stressors and other health issues can lead someone to feelings of hopelessness and despair. It's not easy to manage that alone. Have your buddies back. Trust your gut. If you're worried, it's okay to ask directly about suicide. Encourage strong, storing guns safely and securely. Help them get the support they need when they need it. Learn how you can save a life. That's culturally competent public health messaging. There were examples in COVID where people were doing that. 
where people would say, you know, you are, you know, you, you're a middle-aged man. You are, you're the breadwinner for your family. Your personal responsibility is not to bring COVID home and not to get yourself avoidably sick where you can't be the provider for your family. And you got to go get your vaccine because that's how you protect your family. And that's your individual responsibility. It's sort of an interesting thing. The liberals and conservatives kind of flipped our narratives around, around personal responsibility during COVID. Uh, and uh, you know, I wrote a, another piece that I got mildly minimal high fives for. I wrote in the Washington Post, how should we all respond when a bellicose, un, intentionally unvaccinated patient shows up at the ER with really bad COVID symptoms? And a bunch of us who are vaccinated and who are public health minded are like, I do not want that jerk to get in front of my mom if she shows up at the emergency department needing care. How many of you have that gut reaction to that, incident, to that situation? How many of you are afraid to admit that you either have that reaction or you're checking your phone and you stopped listening to me 10 minutes ago? What's interesting is the normal, the normal liberal response is we don't judge people in the ER. You know, they're human. They show up, they're sick. You know, the gang member who shows up who got shot in an act of retaliatory violence, who, you know, he got shot by the guy whose brother he shot. That's not our business in the ER right now. Our business is to save this human. And, and a bunch of conservatives are saying, wait a minute, I don't want that person to be in front of my mom when she shows up at the ER with a heart attack. And we kind of say, no, that's not the way it works. You know, if, your mom, if he's sicker than your mom, we take him first. But then you get to COVID and a lot of us immediately flip in our head and say, well, you know, you're, it's your responsibility to be vaccinated. And if you're not vaccinated, uh, you know, maybe you need to wait a little longer for that emergency care. And conservatives who, who also flip and they're like, well, he, was, he exercised his free choice not to get vaccinated. You can't punish him in the ER for that. He had a good reason for not getting vaccinated and, and it's not your business. And it's sort of interesting because I think it's appropriate to say, wow, that person did a bad thing by being intentionally unvaccinated, but this is not the moment that, that we act on that anger in the clinical setting. And uh, that we could, I could give a whole medical ethics talk about that. Okay. Uh, but the idea that you need to have identity vouching public health messaging, I think is really important. And, and I think had we had President George W. Bush, he would have actually done that. You know, think of some of the things that George, President Bush said about anti-Muslim uh, prejudice after 9-11, after where he basically uh, said, you know, the, you know and, he, and also actually uh, Mayor Giuliani, where he said the bad guys were in the planes. They're not the Muslim people on the ground. And you need people who can identity vouch. And there's actually a really interesting, Steve Tellis and David Dagan have a fantastic book about criminal justice reform. Uh, prison break, where they talk about how Newt Gingrich and Grover Norquist and, um, and, and, many, and, and a bunch of conservative and libertarian folks got behind criminal justice reform in places like Texas. And identity vouched for the idea that you know, we, we can do criminal justice reform and be good conservatives. They actually had talking points for conservative legislators. They would say things like, prison guards are bureaucrats with guns. That was a, they, they poll tested that. They said, if someone asks you, why are you supporting this criminal justice reform? You're a Texas state legislator. Here's some talking points that you can use. And, and they did not want liberals anywhere near that effort. And, uh, uh, and, and many of the, uh, the leading uh, uh, libertarian political donors you know, were involved in this. And they identity vouched, hey, you can be for criminal justice reform and be a conservative. I also think we have to think about how we train people and why we have a pretty low level of cultural competence in talking across the political divide. And you can tell me if I'm being unfair about this. So, you know, it seems to me that when I think about my work at the Crown School and, and as a public health person, I really don't see us training our students to cross these divides. And it's not just around COVID, by the way. If you say you have a you have a 69 year old African American lady in the South Side of Chicago who is culturally conservative, she's a pro life person, she goes to church every week, and she has an LBGTQ plus child. How do you talk to that person about that issue in a way that 
defends the human dignity and equal humanity and equal rights of that person's child, but also talks with cultural competence towards, the, towards that human being who is ambivalent about her, uh, her child's sexual and gender identity. There's also ways that I think we have to think about some of the unforced errors that we made in shifting public messaging and that gave people a sense that what the public health community was doing was providing strategic rather than transparent messaging during the COVID pandemic. But this is not, I think this crosses the political divide. So, you know, I mean, the most obvious thing was the, was the, um, the mixed messaging around masks. What was actually happening around masks and early in the epidemic was we needed the masks for public health and medical personnel. And there was a real fear that the public was going to hoard these masks and that there would not be available masks for the for medical care personnel. Now, what's, so the way that uh, that Surgeon General Adams and, and uh, Dr. Fauci and others tried to deal with this is they advised people not to wear masks. And very often the message was masks don't work. Got it. I had minus 10 minutes left. No, just kidding. The, um, um, and, you know, and, and, and if you look at this, so here's a quote from Tony Fauci. I don't, I don't regret anything I said then because in the context of the time in which I said it was correct, we were told in our task force meetings that there would be a serious problem with the lack of PPEs and masks for the health providers who are putting themselves in harm's way every day to take care of sick people. He's identifying a legitimate issue, but he used that for strategic messaging. And that, and that erodes your legitimacy. I think they were basically afraid to say, if you use, if we said straight up, please don't use the masks, medical people need them more, that that would not have been strategically effective. And so they chose to say the masks don't work. And I think that was legitimately objectionable. The other thing was watching the shifting views of public health folks around various public demonstrations. So when the lockdown demonstrations started, the public health community, including me, were very, very critical that people were going and marching. People were not wearing masks. They were going to the state capitol. They were marching. And we were like, there's a pandemic. What are you doing? putting a huge mob of people together. And then the George Floyd murder occurs and there are, and there are Black, Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter demonstrations. And many, many of the same people said, well, anti-racism is a public health issue. And, and uh, you know, White Coats, that's a group I'm actually affiliated with, Doctors for America. White Coats for Black Lives, folks were out there. Of course, a lot of politically moder moderate and conservative people saw that and they said, oh, so people that you agree with should march and people that you disagree with should not march. And, you know, that is a real problem. And, and instead of saying to the lockdown demonstration people, let's, let's work with you to figure out how you make your demonstration safe so that it does not become a super spreader event. You know, what we, you know, let's work with you. We don't agree with you about some of the things that you're arguing for, but that's not important. What's important is how we can help you do that safely, which is what people did in the Black Lives Matter demonstrations. Black Lives Matter demonstrations were often very well done from a public health perspective, and they were not super spreader events. But clearly, the public health community was sympathetic to those in a way that they were not for the first, and that made itself felt and affected public perception. Uh, and... Uh, and, and I, I should say, by the way, political adversaries of public health ran with this right away. The article on the, on the right, you know, this is something that, that was politically immediately grabbed. And, and, uh, and conservatives who really were, were not particularly friendly to public health really ran with these things. And, uh, um, you know, I, I just think that that was, that was an unforced error. The other thing, by the way, that happened, which I do not think the public health community should be blamed for, but it's just a reality, is that we are wrongly identified and blamed for actions that are actually done by other political and policy actors. So, you know, one of the things we now know ex post, although we did not know ex ante with the same certainty, schools are closed too long in terms of in, when you think about the trade off between learning loss and COVID spread. We now know ex post, we could have opened up schools earlier. Now, ex ante, I don't think we knew that in the same way that we know now. Uh, but what's interesting was here in Chicago, 
you know, Dr. Arwadi, she was tracking what was happening in the Catholic schools, which opened a lot earlier than the public schools. And she said, you know, the attack rate from COVID is quite low in these populations. In fact, the, the attack rate among students and staff in the Catholic schools was actually lower than it was in the Chicago population at large. And she said, you know, she said from a public health data point of view, we are ready to open the schools. That did not happen not because of public health community, but because, because of the other political actors involved, including the Chicago teachers unions and others. Public health community has borne public blame for that in a way that, that is problematic. And that's not, that's not on the public health community. It's not, that's not our fault, but that's just a reality. Uh, I will say one thing that the imbalance in our classrooms makes this problem worse. And, and, some, and this, is, this, is the, this is a specific non high five aspect of my talk from my colleagues. So you know, I, was, I was listening to some of my colleagues praising a student and how convincingly he espoused a conservative perspective in the classroom. And obviously he himself didn't hold that view, but he espoused it so convincingly. And, and a second colleague in a lecture said with a really distanced intonation, what would you say to a conservative who might argue the following or might respond the following? And the implicit presumption in these conversations was quite clear and it was probably correct. There was no one actually present in the room who was organically expressing that conservative position or even could really accurately tell us what that position was necessarily because it wasn't from us. That's a real problem because out there in the world, that's a lot of America. And, and I do think that if we had better classroom representation, we could have avoided some of the unforced errors that we are making in social services and public health. And by the way, just some polling data, 2018 survey of the, of, uh, the Society of Epidemiological Research, 72.4% of folks report their politics as liberal or left-leaning, less than 5% report conservative or right-leaning. I'm definitely in that 72.4% myself, but it's still concerning. There was one social work program that was analyzed, 9.4% of students identified as Republican. I would say that's probably high if you were talking about the Crown School. 55.9% um, identified as Democrats. Uh, you know, we, we just have a huge issue. And by the way, I think it's very understandable for a lot of reasons. You know, what, what are the values commitment that, commitments that make you go into social work and public health? They don't particularly align with the current orientation of American conservatism. And the sort of moral and intellectual predicament of American conservatism deepens that divide because lots of people quite reasonably say, why would I identify with that? And I'm actually really concerned about it. Uh, and by the way, another thing we see is that there's this joke about the wonk gap there, you know, the estrangement between the academy and American conservatism really worsens this gap. And the thing is it also enables a palpable absolutism and groupthink among progressives. And I think that's a real problem that many of our students just do not have the experience of being in a classroom with conservative peers and being challenged by them in an organic way. And uh, uh, now legal academia, interestingly enough, is more balanced in part because you're training people for a federal judiciary that is very evenly divided among liberals and conservatives. And you have to know how to respond to conservative legal arguments if you're gonna be in constitutional law in the United States, for example. And you know, in our law school, um, you know, we have we have conservative scholars of the highest caliber. Uh, but one of the interesting things when I when I gave the, when I mentioned this talk uh, to one of my colleagues at a very liberal law school, he said we actually have affirmative action for conservative faculty. And if you look at the academic credentials of our conservative faculty, they're actually less extensive than our liberal faculty because we want that diversity. And and our liberal faculty have basically bought into that. That think it's a good idea. But my conservative friends, by the way, deny that this is happening, uh, which was sort of interesting. Another flip of uh, uh, orientation. The, um, and I think it leads to our students being quite confused of, in distinguishing worthy and unworthy conservative arguments. So you know, if you think about these arguments on the left that are just bad arguments or that express values that one must reject, uh, you know, stop the steal, et cetera. But then you think about these arguments on the right, uh, 
you know, these are these are serious arguments that have to be confronted. You know, we have randomized trials that show no excuses. Charter schools, kids have better outcomes than in neighbor than in public schools among the kids that apply for those lotteries. That's just a fact. And if you give a job talk at the Crown School where you say no excuses, charter schools are part of the neoliberal uh, disempowerment of poor America, whatever, you'll get lots of high fives in the room without engaging those randomized trial results. Uh, and uh, you know, if you say the Americans with Disabilities Act has un some un unintended consequences that, that increase hiring discrimination and so on, these are arguments that have to, our students have to hear them, respect them, and address them. Doesn't mean they have to agree with them, but they have to address them. And the idea that every human community is vulnerable to its own groupthink. Two minutes? Less? One minute? So I guess I'll just stop here because I've got this great picture of John Stuart Mill. That's not me, by the way. That's, that's my self-portrait five years from now. The, um, the, you know, the idea that if, you know, John Stuart Mill has this great point that if you only know your side of the, you know, those who know only their own side of the argument know little of that. And I think that in some ways that's where we are. So I'm going to stop here. Ah, say by the bell. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Harold. Uh, so we'll, again, save questions for our panel uh, in a little bit, but we are so thrilled to have um, Dr. Alison Arwadi as our keynote.